All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are y'all doing? See, that usually works. Uh, my name is Ed Benoit, and I'm pleased to be chairing this panel um, that we have called Louisiana the State We're In, which ironically is being filmed for Louisiana the State We're In, which is a weekly um, magazine, right? News magazine on Louisiana public broadcasting. First off, thank you for coming. Hope you enjoy your stay here in Louisiana. And as we were setting up this panel, we wanted to make sure that here at EMEA, you had a good understanding of what's going on in Louisiana uh, related to move it, moving image preservation. And that's what we will be talking about today. To begin with, I, I just want to um, introduce all of our panelists. We'll go through our presentations one by one and then have time at the end for Q&A and discussion. Our first presenter is Leslie Bourgeois from the Louisiana Public Broadcasting in Baton Rouge. She has held this position since 2009. As the first fully trained archivist in the history of LPB, she has been responsible for organizing, preserving, and cataloging LPB's archival collection, which dates back to the station's debut in September 1975. She is the project manager for the Louisiana Digital Media Archive, a joint project between LPB and the Louisiana State Archives. She also manages LPB's participation with the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, which you can learn more about at another panel this week. She has a Bachelor of Arts in History with a minor in Political Science and an MLIS with a specialization in archives from LSU in Baton Rouge. She's also a certified archivist. Gemma Birnbaum is director of the World War II Media and Education Center at the National World War II Museum here in New Orleans. And I do, if you have time, definitely check it out. It is worth your time. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in the history of modern war and genocide from NYU and a master's degree in the history of 20th century labor and industrialization from Tulane. She has been with the museum since 2010, and in her previous role as the assistant director of education for curriculum, she oversaw the production and content curation of all digital learning projects, distance learning initiatives, curriculum materials, student programs, teacher professional development, and special and traveling exhibit educational resources. Her team launched the first in a series of produced curricula titled From the Collection to the Classroom, Teaching History with the National World War II Museum, which has been distributed to over 2,000 teachers nature, nationwide. Mackenzie Roberts is currently finishing her MLIS degree at LSU, focusing on archives. She is interning with the Research Archive and Data Strategy Team at NPR in Washington. She received her BFA in Film and uh, Film Television from Savannah College of Art and Design. Her first MA is in Film Studies from Columbia University, where she produced a thesis on segregated movie theaters in the American South during the early 20th century. She previously interned at the Library of Congress Packard Campus, the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, and worked as a library page for the Billy Rose Theater Division of New York Public Library and museum educator for the Museum of the Moving Image. After graduating, she hopes to continue all of this. And last, and certainly least, is myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Ed Benoit. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Library and Information Science at LSU. Why I need to look down to read about myself is beyond me, <laughs> but I am the coordinator of the Archival Studies and the Cultural Heritage Resource Management Specializations at LSU. I have a MA in History as well as an MLIS and a PhD in Information Studies, all from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and my research currently focuses on 
participatory and community archives. I have a forthcoming book on participator participatory archives with a chapter with uh, the American Public Media Archives, so do check that out. Um, and I also work with non-traditional archival materials, archival education, and the personal archiving habits of the 21st century soldier as part of the virtual Foot Locker project. That is who we all are. <laughs> Sorry that that was a nice long ramble, but I am happy to turn over the mic and get us started today to Leslie. And it helps if I turn this on first. I will just set that there for you. Hi everyone, as Ed said, I'm Leslie Bourgeois, and I'm proud to talk to you today about the Louisiana Digital Media Archive. So the LDMA is an eight-year collaborative project between LPB and the Louisiana State Archives. Um, we launched our public website, ladigitalmedia.org, um, on January 20th, 2015, so we've almost been um, available for three years. Um, we have about 5,500 videos available, um, and we're the first project um, in the nation to combine the catalog of a public broadcaster and a state archives. So first I thought I'd talk a little bit about kind of who the partners are in our collections. Um, LPB is the statewide PBS affiliate here in Louisiana, um, with the exception of New Orleans, um, though we do co-own um, WLAE here in New Orleans. You'll find New Orleans likes to kind of do their own thing sometimes. Um, we've been on the air since September 6, 1975, um, and the oldest video in our collection is actually the dedication of WLPB um, from 1975. Um, and we produce a wide variety of local programming, and I thought I would just highlight a few series. Um, so Louisiana, the state we're in, um, has been on the air since 1976. It's the longest running statewide news magazine in Louisiana, and one of the longest running in the country. Um, and we're currently in season 41 and being filmed as we speak for a story on moving image preservation, so that's exciting. Um, en Francais was a series from the 1980s through early 1990s that was broadcast entirely in French, um, and that was to kind of serve our Cajun and Creole populations, and uh, one of LPB's missions is actually to preserve the French language in Louisiana, so that was one of the ways that we did that. Um, Folks was our minority affairs program from the 80s to the early 90s, really focused on um, issues important to African Americans, to women, the disabled, Native Americans, and other minority populations here in the state. Um, Louisiana Legends has been on the air since 1982, and we still do a few episodes a year, and that's just a 30-minute interview program um, with famous Louisianians. Um, a Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folsom Company is our oldest cooking show, and we do have a couple that we've done through the years. Um, it's been on the air since 1990, and so a lot of Cajun and Creole cooking. Um, and then we also cover Louisiana politics. We've done um, governor state of the state addresses um, since 1978, um, gubernatorial debate since 1979, and inauguration since 1980. And that picture there is actually from probably our most infamous gubernatorial debate from 1991 um, between Edwin Edwards and David Duke. And the tagline from that was vote for the crook, it's important. Um, so, <laughs> sounds about right for Louisiana politics. Um, so the Louisiana State Archives holds a lot of collections um, related to uh, Louisiana's um, political history, um, AV collections. Um, the oldest materials from the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, they hold a few of the commercial television station collections here in the state, including um, WWL and here in New Orleans, KLFY, which is in Lafayette, which is kind of the heart of Cajun country, um, and then WBRZ um, in Baton Rouge. They also have the Brooks Reed collection. He was the ESSO reporter um, in the 50s and 60s in Baton Rouge. Um, and one of kind of the most important reports that we have from him was the first aerial coverage of the damage from Hurricane Audrey, which hit Southwest Louisiana in 1957, and I think was the deadliest hurricane until Katrina. Um, so we actually have amazing footage of that um, that's available on the site. They also film their own video oral histories, um, and they had a series of lectures kind of about how to run an election, like James Carville was there, etc. So now I want to talk about kind of the project timeline for the Louisiana Digital Media Archive. Um, and you'll see the idea really goes back um, to 1999 to 2003 um, for the four-year production process for Louisiana History, which um, is a six-hour series that we did kind of starting from when um, Louisiana was discovered through the 21st century. And as you can imagine, the producers spent a lot of time um, going through the archives around the state trying to find the best footage to use, and it was a really difficult process. Um, 
you know, it was, um, they didn't have a lot of descriptions of what was available, not a lot of it was transferred. Um, and so they discovered, you know, we really need to start preserving this. At the same time, LPB needs to start preserving its own collection because we've been around for a long time too. It took a while because these are television producers and they're also, you know, always making the next thing. But in 2008, we had a collection assessment done uh, by Howard Besser and Kara Van Malsen, who I know is pretty well known to this group. Um, and one of their biggest recommendations is that we needed to partner with other people um, so that we could pool our resources and kind of be more competitive for grants. And so in, um, in 2009, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the Louisiana State Archives. And it really made sense for a lot of reasons. We were already um, kind of partnered with them because we're one of their biggest clients. Um, we also store about 300 of our boxes at their place because it's so big. Um, they were dealing with a lot of the same things we were, and we're also about two to three miles apart in Baton Rouge, so it's close. Um, so then, uh, we did apply for a 2009 National Leadership Planning Grant, and we did get that. Um, so we did all the work in 2010 for that, and I was actually the project manager on that project. Um, and then it really it took us five years after that to actually get the project online. And so I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about what we did. Um, kind of through those years as I kind of talk about the benefits of collaboration for our two agencies. Um, so the first thing that we did, um, we developed our own MySQL database based on PB Core. Um, before this project, LPB had no um, catalog of our assets at all. Um, a couple of FileMaker Pro databases that some producers did, that was about it. And then the State Archives was running an AS400 database that their IT department was just ready to get rid of, and it had character limits on it as well. Um, and so that's kind of hard when you're really trying to catalog things as well as you can. Um, so we developed our own database, um, and you'll see there's five tabs. The first two are PB Core. Um, it's the descriptive metadata and the technical metadata. Um, we put in a section for licensing. Uh, we put in a section so that the state archives could track their accessions since they do take in donations. Um, and then the profile tab is really about a kind of our digital filing cabinet for all of our releases and contracts, et cetera. Um, each partner runs their own digitization project. Um, but we do try to help each other out when we can. LPB engineers have helped set up equipment at the state archives and they help troubleshoot issues as they arise. Um, we also you know, use the barter system to kind of share equipment. Um, the th state archives has a three quarter inch um, SAMA cleaner, so they actually clean all of my tapes for me, which is wonderful because we don't have one of those. Um, and then we also digitize their one inch reels, which that's actually our machine over there in the picture, um, since they didn't have one of those. And then LPB was also one of seven public media stations to participate in the American Archive of Public Broadcasting's National Digital Stewardship Residency Program. We were a host site for that. And our resident, Eddie Colleton, put together a digital preservation plan um, for LPB, that we were also, and which is publicly available, and I'll try to remember to tweet out the link to it. Um, but we were also kind of helping them to put together, um, to use his recommendations to kind of improve um, their workflows as well. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the website. Um, prior to the launch of the LDMA in 2015, the public had very little access to our collections. Um, you could get some recent LPB programming on our station's website, but that really only went back a couple of years. Um, the State Archives entire catalog was available online, but you had to go on site in Baton Rouge to actually um, view any of the clips. So that's, you know, not very convenient. Um, so now the site, um, really provides you know, greater access to our collections and also by combining them we kind of give our users a one-stop shop to kind of find um, things about Louisiana. And the nice thing um, is that because the State Archives has a lot older um, materials because you know, we've only been on the air since 1975, our users get the benefit of that and then um, the State Archives isn't really collecting more recent things and we're producing new shows every week. So you know, you're also going to get kind of 2017 what's going on there as well. And so, and the great thing, um, and what I've found kind of through cataloging, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So you really can kind of follow an issue kind of from maybe even the 1940s kind of through today and kind of see what's been happening. And I think the combined website really works for us because we do have very complimentary collections, um, which almost goes without saying it is all about Louisiana, of course. Um, 
But just kind of the one example that kind of when we were working, I was like, man, this may really work, um, has to do with Ruby Bridges. She was the little girl um, who integrated the New Orleans public schools in 1960. Um, she's also the subject of a Norman Rockwell painting called The Problem We All Live With. Um, and so the State Archives actually has the footage of her integrating um, William Franz Elementary School in 1960 um, under the guard of federal marshals. And then we, LPB, interviewed her for the Louisiana History Series, and she really goes in depth kind of talking about what that day was like for her. And the thing that really stuck out to me is she said she kind of thought it was like Mardi Gras because there were a bunch of, you know, white people screaming at her. <laughs> and, <laughs> and for a kid from New Orleans, that's kind of what you would think when you're five. So um, that really kind of stuck out to me. Um, and then through this project, we're actually using a lot more archival uh, material in our new productions. Um, and that's um, both for our own material and then from the state archives. And just one example I wanted to share, um, you may be aware that PBS just aired like the 18 hour epic, like Ken Burns Vietnam um, series. And so we produced our own local show kind of talking about that from Louisiana's perspective. And it just so happened, I was at the state archives last year and they're like, oh, we just transferred this really cool film. Um, so WWL here in New Orleans used to have tons of money in the 60s and 70s, and they went around the world and did these documentaries, including they went to China in 1972, um, they went to the North Sea um, to follow Louisiana oil workers who were working there. They also went to Vietnam in 1965, and they interviewed all of these um, soldiers from New Orleans. And so I was like, man, we're going to be doing this series. So our program actually opens up with footage from the WWL series, and it really kind of takes you there. Um, so that was like a cool thing that happened, kind of from our partnership. We maybe would have found it, but you know, if we had gone to them, but because I was there, I was like, hey, we should use this. Um, so just a quick note kind of on the future. Um, we have partnered, or hoping to partner with the Chenault Military uh, Museum that's in Monroe up in North Louisiana. Um, they do a lot of um, veteran oral history interviews that we're hoping to make available on the site next year. We're also hoping to learn a lot from what Ed's going to talk about from his survey and maybe kind of help us to see where we can best use our resources to help other um, institutions across the state. Um, and then one other cool thing that I'll mention, um, the First United Methodist Church um, in Alexandria, which is in central Louisiana, contacted us earlier in the year because they had a film from 1943 um, that the church partnered with um, some soldiers who were stationed at Camp Livingston, which is right near Alexandria, and they actually had some people from Hollywood who were stationed there. And so in the middle of World War II, they made this film that was the nativity story, like a 22-minute nativity story in Alexandria. Um, and they like made it look like the desert, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> um, so we were able to get that transferred for them, and we're actually going to be able to post that um, December 18th. So that just another cool thing that we're trying to help other places around the state to kind of preserve that stuff and give the public access to it. And I think that's about it for me. So thank you very much. So, um, so I'm Gemma. I work at the World War II Media and Education Center at the National World War II Museum. We're just a few blocks from here, about a five, ten minute walk. Um, so I thought it might be helpful, you know, for those of you who especially aren't from the New Orleans area, just to tell you a little bit about the World War II Museum. Um, so we're initially founded in, uh, you know, we're opened in 2000, founded about a decade before that, um, by Stephen Ambrose, the author, and our founding president and CEO, Nick Mueller. Um, our goal is to tell the American experience of World War II. So that can be through exhibits, multimedia experiences, personal accounts. Um, we hope that every part of our you know, experience, whether you're on our website or in our galleries, is really immersive in all, all of the content. And most of that comes down to what our digital media can provide. So um, we, you know, we had a few challenges when we were trying to, to do some of these things. So you know, the biggest one being we had um, a research department whose entire job was collecting oral histories and then using those oral histories in various uh, media and exhibits. Um, as you can imagine, the older the veterans get and the further we get from World War II, that job starts to become a little less important. And um, you know, we, we have very few interviews that we're able to conduct now. So what happens to that department of six people, seven people who are collecting oral histories all over the country? Um, so in the first 15 years of the museum, they managed to uh, collect uh, 9,600 personal accounts. Those are 
oral histories, diaries, other things. Um, but we don't really have that as a mission anymore. Um, so we are down to two oral historians, and we try to figure out what do we what do we do with the rest of that staff who has all of this in, you know this institutional knowledge, all of these personal accounts. And so that was part of what went into this media and education center that I'm running. So we have um, a digital content manager who came from that team, and really his job is to manage that content to. Um, to figure out how we use it in our exhibits, to figure out how we use it with our education programs, um, our teacher training, uh, a lot of the other things. And so we've, um, you know, th this came out of a 2011 strategic plan, so it's been a long time coming. But, you know, in addition to not knowing where we were going to go once we didn't have that veteran population, we also wanted to figure out um, where are these materials the most useful. Uh, so. I'm under an umbrella department called Education and Access, and we always felt like it was very important to figure out ways to share these materials um, to as many people as possible, and for most audiences, free or low cost. Uh, the vast majority of people right now who use our digital collections are families of veterans, students, and teachers, um, and other people who are doing research. And you know. I think we can all, having been students or having been teachers, know that's not really where the money is. <laughs> um, it's not like we're all just sort of rolling in uh, secret dough that we haven't told anybody about. So, um, so the first slide here, this is our, our sort of signature auditorium in our media and education center. And this will serve as both um, a center for uh, digitization and for other things in conjunction with our curatorial department as well as a place where we can record new digital content. So this auditorium, which seats 100 people, is something we don't really have right now. And it's a dedicated space where you can live stream, where you can record, um, and, when you and then you can make that uh, content easily available on our website. Um, so the mission of the Media and Education Center is to serve as the epicenter of digital content production and broadcasting, uh, supporting the museum into new phases of educational outreach and digital content development. <coughs> Um, so this could include anything from um, expanding our uh, teacher training to not just on site but being able to offer it online and doing online education, which is not something we do a ton of right now, um, expanding our distance learning. So right now we serve a very robust K-12 audience, but how do we expand that beyond K-12? Um, so that's, that's really the main goals. And how do we use our collection materials and our digital content to make that as excellent as possible? <laughs> so um, our purpose and goals expand distance learning. Um, so we'd like to, you know, we're, we're making moves towards higher education and lifelong learners. And then the biggest one was to centralize digital content and media across curatorial services, education, and other departments in the museum. We have multiple departments that each house thousands of hours of footage and other things. So in uh, the former research department that is now a part of um, the Media and Education Center. We have something like 900 hours of National Archives archival footage that we collected on trips there. So how does anybody else access that in the museum? Right now they have to ask us, they can't. Um, so part of this is centralizing, making sure everything goes into the digital asset management system that's being created. Um, and making sure that everybody knows these assets are available both within the institution and to the wider public who may need them. And that's the, that's the hard part, that's the challenge. So centralizing that content, and this also includes things like making sure that all licensing requests come through this one department because you could have somebody need content from both curatorial services, you know, they need archival uh, photographs, but they may also want to license part of a lesson plan. So how do you centralize that? And uh, right now, we're working towards making sure everybody just comes through one person because it started to get very confusing for people who ask for things. And you never want somebody to be confused when they come to your website or go to your museum. And so we talked about the main media studio. And then we have a, a, a classroom. So this goes a little bit, it's a little bit different from what I think would be classified as a smart classroom, uh, which a lot of places have started using and some schools have. But this is designed to facilitate both on-site and online programs for teachers, students, and lifelong learners. Um, and it's equipped with integrated video conferencing and live stream technology to reach national audiences. So one of the things we, you know, some of the feedback we kept getting from our teachers that we trained on-site over the summer was that they never got to meet the other teachers that we trained or they never 
never got to meet teachers from other places. So they were always wondering about who else had taken some of our programs. So we thought it would be really cool, you know, once this Media and Education Center is officially open, to actually have some of these classrooms live stream or conf video conference with each other from other sites. So you could theoretically have a teacher training program happening in Normandy, France, which we do, and have them talk to the teachers that are being trained in New Orleans. And so suddenly you're, you're not just using digital content that already exists, you're creating new content through these relationships that we, that we already have and we don't necessarily make the most of right now. And then the distance learning studio is a dedicated space to broadcast into classrooms and other institutions with these one-on-one -on -one connections. So the museum currently has 14 virtual field trips, which, um, which we're currently in the process of completely redesigning. We got a green screen for the first time. It's very exciting. And so these really deal uh, with in-depth uh, World War II topics. So if a teacher wants to get a 45 minute lesson on D-Day and have us show artifacts and interact, we can do that. Um, and right now we are doing that in a makeshift uh, office that we've made into a studio. And so we're very excited to eventually have a real studio that's going to be in this media and education center. And then we have a recording studio that we're building, which will, um, how many people have had to soundproof a room without actually having, yeah, a few people are kind of like, Ugh. So um, there's carpet glue, can only do so much when you're trying to put soundproofing into a, into a studio. So you can still kind of hear things in the hallway. So our biggest goal with this is really to just have a very quiet space where you can't actually hear what's happening in the rest of the museum. Um, and the way, you know, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. The museum initially started, it was a warehouse, like an old warehouse space. And so it's not exactly conducive to things like soundproofing, uh, weatherproofing, other things that may come up in an archive. <laughs> so there's been a lot of uh, construction to fix some of those issues that started all the way back in you know 2000 when we first opened. Um, so this will record modules for credit and non-credit online courses, voiceovers for film content and podcasts, other things like that. And then editing suites. So. Um, Right now, our editing suite consists of making sure that the people who do our digital content have really big headphones that are, um, you know, noise canceling, and that's about it. So having the dedicated space to create some of these products will allow us to ex uh, expand that access to our collection in a way that we haven't really been able to before. Oop. So um, the uh, sorry. That threw me for a second. <laughs> so the Media and Education Center, uh, even though we're already doing the work, is not scheduled to open until May 2019 right now. So uh, it'll be part of something called the Hall of Democracy, which will also house a library, a special exhibit hall, and a new program called the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. And so each of these um, spaces will really serve to promote the digital collection, um, the thousands of hours of footage that we have of museum programs and things like that into one place. Um, right now they're kind of all over the place and I think a lot of people can relate to this, this sort of uh, multiple departments creating content but not necessarily having that central location. So the Media and Education Center is the answer to that. And you know we, we've only been open six months so we are hoping that's the answer. <laughs> but if anybody has any ideas during the Q&A, just let me know. But um, all right, thank you. And now you're going to hear from me again. <laughs> so building off of both of uh, those presentations, one of the issues that I was really interested in was trying to identify what sort of collaboration and collaborative opportunities could we have in Louisiana. And particularly after the flooding in 2016 um, and the number of people that came to me asking for help with salvaging materials, I began wondering, well, how many like working pneumatic decks do we have in this state? How many working quad decks and nobody knows the answer <laughs> and how many of this type of material and how much of that type of material and so I began thinking we need to really do a little bit of a survey to really identify what types of audiovisual material there are 
and what types of equipment. So for this presentation, I'll first start, you can tell I'm a teacher. <laughs> I'll start with the background and methodology. We'll discuss the results, a little discussion, conclusion, future directions. Beautiful picture of Louisiana there. Uh, a little bit of a background. As most of you know, in 2004, the Heritage Health Index surveyed 14,500 uh, 14, repositories in the United States, trying to really capture what this snapshot was of American cultural heritage. According to its report, 44% of all moving images, uh, moving image items, which was 17 million, or excuse me, 18 million, um, and 47% of recorded sound items, roughly 22 million, were held in small or medium-sized repositories. And although the repositories only reported 14% of recorded sound and 12% of moving image collection as so-called in need, about half of the collections they reported as saying, uh, I don't know, I, I really don't know what the status of this collection is. Now, unfortunately, the follow-up to this in 2014, I still have yet to be able to find that report. I think it's uh, still forthcoming. But there was another study in 2010 uh, surveying 163 special collections and found 61% of res respondents said they're in desperate need for uh, audiovisual. A 2015 ALA report found an increase, surprisingly, from less than 1% of material to 8% of all material being digitized was audiovisual. Now, as you can see, I keep saying audiovisual. The intent of this survey actually did include both moving image and recorded audio. But for the rest of the presentation today, we're going to skip over the recorded audio bits, uh, mainly because I would talk for a half an hour if we could do that. I partnered with the Louisiana Archive and Manuscript Association, our state level Ar archives association, to develop a Qualtrics-based online survey with both closed and open-ended questions, descriptive statistics, and coding analysis used for the analysis. Now we use the, we have a, a directory of all of the archives in Louisiana. It's roughly 316 institutions of which 191 are really institutions. <laughs> There's a lot of little small collections that they happen to have five collections and they have a volunteer who comes in once every three months. So we did send them the survey, but not surprisingly, the 191 were the ones that we were really focusing in on. 16 I had a return to sender and an email bounce back, so I don't know how to get a hold of them. But 57 responded, about 30%, so not great, but not horrible. Uh, I would love to have more, but we always would. And of that, 37% indicated, well, we just don't have any AV material. So for the rest of the presentation, it's going to be based on the 36 Louisiana repositories that said, yes, we do have AV material and equipment. Uh, as far as what type of archives, they could choose more than one. So, but it's not surprising, uh, a lot of special collections, a lot of college, university archives. Uh, I, I found the other to be very interesting, folklore, historic houses, nonprofits, a television archive <laughs> also participated. And when you look at the size of these repositories, they all fit that like that small medium size, less than 21 full-time staff. Um, we asked about how many collections they had. I need to change my survey. Uh, some people reported in linear feet, some people reported in cubic feet, and that's not really a good way of converting those. Uh, what's surprising is five respondents had, what? That's actually cut off on the bottom. Oh, I guess I did ask, add a little something. But 5% uh, of five respondents had no idea um, what they had. So that, that was a bit of a problem. And four respondents indicated how many items and up to 145,000. 
And now I'm going to hand it over to Mackenzie to go over the results. Okay, uh, so my name is Mackenzie Roberts and I'm just gonna go over some of the results that we found. So when you're looking at the audiovisual materials that, that were being housed in most of these collections, the mean was 11.4. Um, and what's interesting to note is that the 0% is due to some archives having audio but not moving image, so which is why we kept them up there. Um, and the majority of holdings are between 1 and 10%. So it, that's actually a little higher than we were expecting. Here's a better looking chart for that same information. Uh, you'll see that a lot of them start out at 0 and the average is mostly about 10%. So when we started to look at film formats, the number one film format that we found in most holdings was 16 millimeter. Uh, we thought that it would have been eight millimeter, but it happens to be 16. And so you have 16 as the top, and then it would be eight millimeter, 35, and then super eight. For our videotape formats, it's not surprising that VHS is the number one. Uh, I'm sure we all still have a VHS somewhere in our own home, anyways. And the second would be Betamax, the third is Mini DV, and it also is compared to Betamcam, which is about the same for third place. Um, but all these categories have over 10%, which is kind of unusual. You would think everybody has two, three, especially in Louisiana. So for our, the optical video formats, it's no surprise, DVD is number one, considering you can still buy DVDs today. Um, and it's also the easiest one to hand out to researchers, and it's the smallest that we have right now for most consumers. And the last holding of the other is interesting to note that some people have baby pathé, uh, which is really unusual. Um, and people are starting to get to cloud videos. Uh, there's a lot of places that are starting to try and make it accessible and have it held somewhere else, not near a flooding. <laughs> so. Um, so we're going to skip the audio section, but if you guys have any questions or want to know more, you're more than welcome to come find us. So back over here, uh, the repositories, if you look at them, they know that they have a good amount with 40%, which is a good amount saying, because you're the audience that would know, 40% is nice to know that you have and that you know the collection. But at the same time, 60% of having no idea what your condition is of your collection, that's not great either. So it could be a hit or miss depending on how you look at it, if you're a half empty, half full glass person. And so we talked a little bit about doing the moving image equipment section of you know, can we borrow, can we loan, can we work together? Um, and obviously DVD is the best working equipment that we have in the state because you can still buy them. <laughs> um, VHS, it's not hard to get. I think I've gone into many used shops and I still find them to this day, still working. Uh, and a lot of home videos were also kind of like VHS, so consumers still have them. Um, but the unknown is in the gray area, so people have them, but it's unclear. And then the not working, people still keep them. Uh, I assume it's for spare parts. And then the purple is what's working. And we also have the same information for the audio equipment, if you guys have any more questions about that as well. So I'm going to put it back to Ed. OK, so the, ne the next chunk of questions that we asked were specifically about cooperative opportunities. How willing were people to engage in this uh, cooperative process. And two thirds of people said either definitely yes or probably yes. So that's a very positive response. Um, and then the concerning part here is, so the darker the purple, the more positive, the yellow is no. Um, and here the categories are, well, what if it required you to have your materials leave your repository? Oh, okay, maybe. What if it required act, providing other people access to your equipment? People are negative generally on that. Training within the state that would require travel? Okay, the most positive was webinar-based training in this area. 
And there were many concerns with cooperation, uh, starting with shipping and handling issues, uh, a, a north-south Louisiana divide. Uh, one participant stated, quote, I wonder how effective such a collaborative pro uh, program can be in a state where, po where population is very unevenly distributed and people in south Louisiana have, in general, an aversion to traveling to north Louisiana. <laughs> I think a cooperative group makes more sense for Baton Rouge and the New Orleans area. Okay. <laughs> There's also concern about the time commitment that this would involve and the general lack of staff. Um, the equipment fragility, that simply loaning equipment or the equipment may be good, may be functional for two or three uh, runs, but after that it's going to break. Uh, so. Just general issues like that. So just a little bit of quick discussion. The rest of these images, by the way, are from the Louisiana story and the making of that. Um, it was interesting to see the, the high amount of audiovisual materials in Louisiana and the wide variety of available equipment and formats. Now, of course, the caveat here is simply the lack of known condition lack of known condition of both the equipment as well as the material. And this is really where I think a cooperative effort must begin. There is potential here for cooperation, but it's going to require somebody dedicated to keeping it going. We can't just have uh, the repositories in the state volunteer their time to start a cooperative effort. There would really need to be some sort of a grant opportunity to start this off. And yes, it'll probably start with Baton Rouge and the New Orleans area. And there's just generally issues with audiovisual knowledge among archivists. And for more about that, please see the panel tomorrow about audiovisual archiving education. So in general, there's a, a, a big feeling of we really want to join this, but we don't want to provide a lot. Uh, more of we, there's a lot we could take, but not a lot that we could give. And so that's a bit of a, a concern, but I, I think there's still enough here that could be built on. And the future directions uh, for myself is actually starting to work with uh, the vast majority of the respondents did agree to participate in further discussion and maybe some grant writing opportunities, perhaps even extending it to the entire Gulf Coast region to see where we can go from there. And that is all I have. Although, just real quickly, because I wanted to highlight this, they're editing film on a bayou. Okay, this is just great. <laughs> And this is an oil rig that they're shooting on. And here they're actually going down uh, one of the bayou and filming. OK, that's, <laughs> I just have to highlight that. Um, so now I'd like to open it up for uh, questions and, and discussion for any of the panelists. Uh, yes. Um, did you establish, so what was the clear to me were, do all the audiovisual holdings relate specifically to the state of the or, like uh, I, I suspect many of us, we have collections that are regionally specific, but mm -hmm. then we have more general material within our collections. Uh, yeah, th this time around, we actually didn't specify are they Louisiana subject based or not. Um, that would be something very interesting to go into. Well, well the reason I ask that is I, I wonder be, because oftentimes it feels so, the problem feels almost insurmountable. Mm -hmm. um, if you can generate, I think it seems to me there are two things you need to do. One is generate a sense of critical, the problem is critical, so action has to be taken yeah. now. You know, in the case of magnetic tape, we're, we're talking about having eight years and eight years only. So everyone wants to be part of it, but no one wants to commit. And that sort of attitude can't go on because we don't have the time. But then if you're also able, and I, I suspect some of the institutions don't know the answer to this, but if you're able to limit the quantity down to likely unique material, 
mm -hmm. then the problem is lessened somewhat. You know, if, it, if it's 100,000 things, but only 50,000 of them are truly unique to the state, then the problem, you know, it's about generating fear, fear of inaction, um, or cost of inaction, which mm -hmm. is quite, quite critics, but also creating a, a sense that the problem's not so huge that it can't be tackled and, and outcomes can't be achieved. Well, and getting that first bit of success and then building off of that. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great point. Thank you. Uh, wow, well, there's so many hands. I'm going to go up front here first. I have a question for Leslie. Leslie, you just said that each partner uh, would identify their own collection. Mm -hmm. Did you all agree on one specific uh, format, on one specific uh, streaming format or master format? Right, so um, when we first started, we kind of went with what resources we already had, and they weren't perfect, I'm going to be honest, because um, we started at IMX50 as our preservation um, material, uh, format, excuse me, um, and so we kind of both went that way, and so now after we had the digital preservation plan, um, we actually just moved to doing FFV1 with an MKB wrapper, and that's what, um, and our IT engineer actually wrote a program to kind of process those files, and so we've actually, in the past couple of weeks, we're helping the state archives to kind of get that up and running, so we can all, you know, move better into kind of best practices. So, yeah, and we do. Um, and then they also decided to keep their own files um, at their own shop, and then we keep our own at our own shop. They're doing the cloud, and we're just doing LTO tapes, kind of in geographically distributing them. That answers your question. In the back there. Yeah, I have a question for Leslie. Just stay up here. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned the website that you uh, have video available for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, we use Google Analytics um, to do that, and to be honest, we haven't really used that to shape at this point. Um, just programming-wise, we kind of decide on doing a topic every month just to kind of highlight something maybe that's going on. Like we're doing Native American Heritage Month this month, and we'll do Mardi Gras in January kind of thing. Um, and I will say, actually, in the past month or two, um, the visitor or page views have gone up tremendously. In part, we've been doing Vietnam oral histories around the state. We've probably recorded over 70, and people are really interested in that. And also, um, the Tom Cruise movie, American Made, um, is about a guy from Baton Rouge, Barry Seal, who was a drug smuggler. And the WBRZ collection had two reports on him from the 80s, and there's been a lot of local interest for those two reports. So those are available on our site, and we highlighted those. So that's just, we're trying to just keep up with what's going on um, to kind of drive our programming that way, I guess. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> Back here. <laughs> Well, and, and that's actually a great point. Uh, so one of the things we did, um, there was fair warning about this, uh, the survey about two months beforehand. And even with the survey, we mailed them a physical copy. So if they wanted to go actually just look real quick to fill it out. Now, that being said, you, you bring up a great point. And I know based on some of who responded, although I cannot reveal that, because of my IRB, um, that there, there was a good percentage of them who had recently done a full preservation survey 
uh, where they've uh, partnered with outside consultants and brought them in. But I, I think a lot of people, a lot of the respondents who identified that they don't know that this also might be impetus for, well, maybe we should partner with, let's say, a local school of library and information uh, science and have some of our students assist them with going through the entire collection if possible, or even writing a small grants. I know one of the local repositories, it was a very small grant that paid for the consultant to come in and verify what they had, not just in moving image, but uh, across the board. But you do raise a good point. Thank you. Uh, other, yes, Shep. So we're in a very, very long process of migrating over to NetX right now. Um, it's It has good and bad. Um, anybody here work at NetX? I don't want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so I, I think you know it, it offers um, a lot of flexibility in terms of the type of content that we have. So it's not just you know digital collection content. It's also around 700 hours of archived speeches from our international conference on World War II. And it was one of the few things we found that actually was built to handle multiple types of content um, and make it really easily searchable and accessible for people who aren't necessarily as well versed in it, who work in the rest of the museum. You know, not everybody in a museum is an archivist, of course. Not everybody is a curator. And so how do um, how do we pick something that everybody can can use? How does somebody in the president's office quickly search for a, an image that they want? So it's all going into NetX, um, and then the one area where we're still trying to decide what systems we're using is um, for customer relationship management and for licensing. So that's the one thing that it doesn't necessarily do is when somebody licenses an image. Um, and it expires after the five-year license, we won't know unless we write that down somewhere else. So we're still trying to figure out some of the, the workflows with that. Um, but so far, NetX has been by far, um, despite being so arduous to, to set up, has been the easiest in terms of non-archival staff being able to ingest content and things like that. Um, it's very user-friendly in a way that some of the other systems really aren't unless you already like have the library and information science degree <laughs> which most people again don't so um and then of course we we're still using um emu for um probably forever <laughs> do enjoy uh lunch here in new orleans and i hope you guys have a a good rest of the conference thank you for attending <laughs>